Before we get started, this podcast would not be possible without the support of Q Super. This Queensland-based super fund is dedicated to improving the financial well-being of its members and their communities. And the good news is that anyone can join Q Super. Find out more by searching YQ Super online. A listener production. I'd severed my trachea. My lungs instantly collapsed. I was in a pretty bad way. All I wanted to do was I wanted to show that I tried to save myself. 242, have you responding to one? We have a young lady unconscious. Top approach 1320. Hi, I'm Lana Mitchell from the Royal Flying Doctor Service, and this is a podcast series about mateship, about life in the bush, and about the role that the Royal Flying Doctor Service plays in servicing rural communities. This is the Flying Doctor Podcast. My first thought was, oh, bugger it, I've killed myself. And uh, for about, I don't know how long, I just lay down in the dust and sort of gave up. I just thought I was dead. There are many things we don't give a second thought to. One of these is breathing. When you're stressed, people encourage you to concentrate on your breathing, slow it down, and give your body the nourishing deep breaths that it needs. But what if you can't breathe? When I first heard David Donovan's story, it made me cringe. It made me think about breathing and how we take every breath for granted. David's tenacity, his drive, and pure will to survive despite the odds had me wanting to interview him. Though David's an adult now, living on the Gold Coast, As a 16-year-old, he went to school at Rockhampton Boys Grammar and he would spend holidays assisting his dad on their vast cattle station in Queensland. This was in the late 1980s. It had been a wonderfully affluent time for the family as their main property, named Birkin, had paddocks lush with buffalo grass and their cattle were shiny and fat. David's dad had made a good estimate on rain falling on the black soil plains at just the right time of year so their revenues were further bolstered with a crop from thousands of hectares of sunflowers. As a result, the family decided to expand their holdings and they bought a new place, 600 kilometres due west and not far from Longreach in the heart of central Queensland. This new 30,000 hectare station was perched on the rugged western side of the Great Dividing Range, about 60 kilometres north of Jericho. To reach it, you drove for nine hours westward with the last stretch appropriately called Desert Road, and the property was called Speculation. And this is where we come to the subject of breathing. And you'll hear in this interview that David has a slightly laboured breathing process, which is a consequence of the injuries he's sustained. So in the 80s, Dave, there's no mobile phones, there's no smart devices. So how did you used to entertain yourself during school holidays? Um, Entertain myself? Well, usually we just worked pretty much all holidays. You know, that's the way it was. So pretty much, you know, I think Dad regarded from the age of about five, we were adults, we were workers. So we'd be, you know, just spent, you know, I just spent virtually the whole time on the horse. But... In terms of entertaining ourselves, Dad had a soft spot for cricket, so that that was that gave us a break, you know, when we, whenever a test was on or a one-day match. And we also had a uh, actual concrete net out the back, and so we'd always be encouraging Dad to, you know, go down and throw us down a few balls to get out of working. You know, we were all very lazy and we, <laughs> we wanted to get out of work. You know, there was more jobs than there was time to do it, so in the holidays I might, you know, spend 12 hours ploughing uh, or I might, you know, you might be going mustering or you might be drafting cattle or putting up fences. Checking fences was a constant thing. Checking waters, you know, it's always dry. Where uh, the accident actually happened, which we'll get to, was at uh, a place called Speculation, west of the Great Dividing Range. It's actually right on the edge of the Great Dividing Range, but a 72,000-acre property which we'd bought to uh, run breeders out there and we'd fat them up, you know, down in, down on the Mackenzie River, down at Birkin. Dad had only bought that about a year before my accident, 1987, and so I virtually didn't even know it. I think it was the first time I'd been there out at speculation. Uh, went there over the 
Christmas holidays between grade 11 and 12 and, you know, was there for over a month with just Dad and me. So let's go back to that fateful day. There'd been a lot of recent stormy weather and your dad wanted you to go and check all the boundary fences to make sure that none had been damaged or washed away. And so the property speculation that you were at, so when your dad said go and check the boundary fences, this was uh, quite a significant task because it wasn't a property you were familiar with. No, not at all. I'd, I'd... I'd driven down part of uh, the boundary fence, and I forget this is a big property, virtually a square, but I think it was about 20 miles each side, so it's a big job. I wasn't familiar with it at all, particularly not this, the, the section of the fence line uh, where I had my accident. It was actually on the other side of the main road, uh, so it's not something that you'd even normally see, but that's no excuse for, you know, for, <laughs> for what happened, but yeah, I wasn't familiar with it at all. Gotcha. And what were you driving? I was driving a little Suzuki 80cc farm bike, one of those little bikes. That I, don't, I don't even know if they have them anymore. Pretty small. It's just got really thick wheels. Could get up to, you know, maybe 60 k's an hour or something like that. But it's a good little thing to do burnouts and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's right. quite a fun little, little bike. Gotcha. So as you headed off on this task assigned by your dad, what was your mood? Oh, it was good. Uh, it was actually the first day of the um, fifth test against England where they'd, when they'd picked uh, – Australia was getting slammed by England in the Ashes. I think we'd lost every test. But then they'd picked this Peter Taylor, who everyone thought was meant to be Mark Taylor. You know, they thought they'd made a, mistake, made a mistake, but Australia was doing extremely well in that test. And so I was in quite a good mood. And plus, it had been raining for about the previous two weeks, so we'd virtually done no work. And uh, all I'd been doing was putting up the fence around the uh, new airstrip, which we'd just put in. In fact, Dad had just radio, radioed in the coordinates uh, for that airstrip uh, that morning to the flying doctor, which, uh, which we used, which was our only communication to the outside world uh, through the, uh, you know, the, the uh, radio system that they operated that stuff. So basically the flying doctor, people wouldn't really realise this, didn't only you know, provide the service of <clears throat> fixing us up, but also, you know, would get messages out for us. You know, I found out my uh, TE score results through the Flying Doctor the following year out of speculation. Mm. Um, and so he'd just coordinate, uh, just radioed in where the airstrip was, which we'd just built that very morning. You know, looking forward to going out there and, you know, seeing a bit of new country. Great. So at what point on this journey of travelling around and checking a very, 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 very long boundary fence. Mm. At what point did things go wrong? Uh, I rode out uh, in the morning, uh, you know, it was pretty early. I don't know what time it would have been, about 8 o'clock. And one of the other jobs that Dad had given me to do was to uh, check out a paddock on the way, which we'd burnt off just before, very fortuitously. So we'd burnt it off and then we got all this rain. And it doesn't rain very much out there, as you probably know. You know, we're on the desert road. And so, yeah, he wanted me to, to ride around. And, of course, I wasn't familiar with the place and everything's dead and I got sort of turned around. And so I spent ages trying to get out because of these vast paddocks. <laughs> and eventually I found a fence and got my way back onto the road. And uh, I noticed that I hadn't fueled up the bike that morning. It was just only half full. So I thought, oh, maybe I should go back and you know, f f fuel it up before I go. But I thought, no, I'll have enough. And so I kept on going. So <laughs> it was little decisions like that, you know, fates are decided, I guess. You know, if I'd have gone back, this probably would never have happened. Anyway, uh, I continued on, went across the, the highway, went through the wire gate next door. Uh, our boundary on the left-hand side, if you like, on the southern side, was only about a kilometre uh, down a hill. So I rode up the top of the hill and then there was a, a fence coming out, you know, perpendicular to the boundary. Obviously the, the neighbours had put in a, a paddock there. And so you had to ride actually off that fire break road to go through a gate, a Y gate, and then, you know, turn around and go down. So I did that, went down and checked the rest of the our boundary. There was nothing broken. 
Dad wanted me to check that fence because with, obviously, with wild weather, you know, there could be stuff over the fence and, you know, branches and whatnot, you know, broken wires. So I went down there. There was, you know, fortunately nothing wrong with that uh, length of the fence. And when I was coming back, the road was overgrown uh, because it wasn't driven down very often by little saplings and scrub. And so I got all these tree ants all over my arms. And as I was riding up the hill, and as you ride up this fairly steep hill, you can't see the fence coming out perpendicular. I was wiping all these ants off me, off my arms, in a bit of a fury. And um, I remembered that I'd left the gate open at the top, but I'd forgotten that the gate wasn't actually on the road. So uh, I looked up about 20 metres away from this, uh, from what I thought was going to be an open gate, to see a barbed wire fence coming rapidly towards me. And so I threw my, my head back uh, and the wire caught me just under the chin on two sides. Uh, on the left-hand side, for some reason, the scars disappeared, but on the right-hand side, it's still very evident and uh, picked me up and just the bike continued on and the wire stretched out about 10 yards and then deposited me in the bulldust. Oh, my gosh. Did you immediately know you were in trouble? (laughs) Absolutely immediately. For some reason, I don't know how it happened, I just knew what had happened. My first thought was, ah, bugger it, I've killed myself. That's what I thought. (laughs) I just knew that I'd snapped my... uh, voice box, my trachea, that was clear. I could barely get any breath in immediately. I was breathing, you know, incredibly stertorously just to force air down uh, into my lungs. And uh, for about, I don't know how long, I just lay down in the dust and sort of gave up. I just thought I was dead, you know, that I, that I, that I didn't have any hope. Bear in mind that this is about, you know, it was about 12 miles or 20 20-odd kilometres away from the homestead and I just didn't have any energy. Instantly I'd lost all my energy. I just couldn't get enough air. What, what had happened was I'd severed my, my trachea, smashed my voice box, severed my, my vocal cords. Uh, my trachea had dropped right down into my chest cavity. Uh, the other part, because it's sort of elastic, that, uh, that stuff, the other part had gone, you know, further up. So I was breathing through... Um, you know, through, a bo- through the body cavity. So I was only getting a minuscule amount of air into my lungs, which meant that, that my lungs instantly collapsed, right? In no time, they just deflated. And so, yeah, I was in a pretty bad way. But uh, having said that, after maybe a minute or two, I just decided, well, I'm not just going to sit here in the dust crying. Because, you know, they'll think that I did it on purpose or, you know, it won't be good for my family. They'll, they'll want to know that I at least tried to give myself a chance. And so I, I picked up the bike and, um, you know, started to ride home or tried to start to ride home. Was there a lot of blood? Were you, were you like, bleeding profusely or was it just <coughs> you couldn't get air and you just... I'm just trying to... Uh, it's a horrible question to ask, but I'm just oh, trying a, to... There was, a, there was a fair bit of blood, but that wasn't really my concern. It wasn't... I wasn't be- bleeding profusely. It didn't hit any any major arteries or anything, thank God. Could have easily done so. But, um, yeah, I uh, wasn't even concerned about that. I was just concerned about breathing and just... I had no energy. I suddenly had no energy. And bear in mind, I was incredibly fit at this time. God, I just, you know, with crowbar and shovel put up a you know, a mile-long fence, uh, you know, rosewood post fence uh, around this airstrip. So I was I was as fit as I've ever been, probably ever been since at that time. And so it was quite shocking not to have any energy. But uh, having said that, that's probably one of the reasons that uh, I was able to continue on. Of course, there would have been probably a lot of adrenaline and so on pumping through my system, but actually I just really... Wanted, I thought I was dead, 100% thought that there was no chance at all that I would survive. And it's a very weird feeling when you've actually virtually given up and you think, well, I just, all I wanted to do was I wanted to show that I tried to save myself. Wow. Go, you know, maybe in the back of my mind, I thought there was a one in a million chance that I might be able to get back. But uh, at that time, I thought I was definitely dead. 
you know, so everything that's happened since is like a second life. It's a, it's a very strange experience when you when you feel like you've already died. Right. That's okay. So mm. could you describe for me then the journey um, of you in this horrifically injured state with, you know, gasping for, for air, now trying to get back on your little ADCC bike mm. through the saplings and the undergrowth and trying to yeah. get back. Would you describe well, that journey for me? Well, if only it was so easy because I couldn't get the bike started to begin with. Number one, I had to obviously, you know, I had to, uh, uh, you know, hit it, you know, with the whatever they call it. I haven't ridden a motorbike for years, you know. The Kickstarter. The kickstart. I had to do that and it wouldn't start. And then eventually, after about four or five goes, it did start. I thought, oh my, thank goodness. As it turned out, the bike had been damaged in the accident, right? Because it went through, you know, the wire fence as well. Thank God the tyres didn't go flat. And so uh, I got it started and then I headed off. It was going all right in first gear. I put it into second, it instantly stalled. So something had happened to the cylinder head and, um, you know, effectively every time uh, I tried to go any quicker than 15 or so kilometres an hour, slipping into second gear, it would stall. And then did you have gates and things to open and close as well? (laughs) Yeah, there was... (laughs) There was so many gates. First gate I came to was the one back uh, on our boundary, back which led onto the, you know, across the highway and back into, you know, past our letterbox and, you know, back into our farm proper. I didn't even get off the bike. I was too tired. So I pulled up at this wire gate and I, they're basically just a part of the fence with a bit of a stick, a loop in the ground where, you you know, you put the, you know, where you put the post into and, you know, I thought, one coming out perpendicular with a little hook. So I had to, you know, navigate this contraption and sometimes they're quite tight and a bit hard to, you know, a bit hard to strain back up. As soon as I stopped, the bike stalled. So I managed to open it and I said, stuff it, I just threw the gate on the ground. I didn't even close the gate, something that I have been ch- I was chided for by my brothers afterwards mm-hmm. for not closing the gate. <laughs> Anyway, so I drove through, managed to start the the little Suzuki back up again, you know, with difficulty, you know, constantly. I was a bit worried that it wouldn't start. And bear in mind that I'm very weak and that effort in starting it was just gargantuan. It was just such a big effort. But I got it going and then there was about another three, of the, three or so of those wire gates and fortunately another couple of easier, you know, gates to open on the way back, about five gates in total on the way back to the to the homestead. I have to ask, Dave, would you were you like dizzy or were you other than the extreme tiredness and the and the craving for air that you weren't able to get, was there was there dizziness or were there other things that you were experiencing? Were you in pain at that time? What I felt, I think, was just weirdly enough, just a complete sense of calm and clarity. And just, uh, I don't know whether it was something to do with having sort of given up, but just trying. But I just, I was just thinking hard uh, about, you know, my family, what they'd think. I was sort of, to be honest, I felt more concerned about how upset my dad would be and my mum, you know, my brothers and my sister, you know, how how that would affect them. And, you know, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be great having, you know, like a sibling or a son or to die. Uh, and that was worrying me. And then I just, I wouldn't say that I was terribly religious at that time. You know, Dad was quite religious. But I started just uh, saying the Lord's Prayer over and over again <laughs> in my head. Mm. The Lord's Prayer was the only prayer that I knew. And, uh, yeah, that sort of kept me going. About halfway home, though, I must say, things started going dim. I thought, oh, yeah, this is it. I've been waiting for this. Like it was a sunny day. I was... It had sort of fined up, but I could. See it felt like it was getting overcast, and I thought, "Oh." And um, to be honest, I can't remember anything uh, in the second half of that uh, that ride home really, until I rode over the grid into the little compound of uh, sheds and stuff, and um, saw Dad uh, working in the back of one of the utes in the shed. Wow! Mm-hmm. What did yeah. your dad say when he saw you? 
Well, uh, first of all, he didn't recognise me because uh, because I'd been breathing uh, air into this body cavity. I had what's known as uh, surgical emphysema. I had full surgical emphysema, which meant that I'd sort of ex- expanded like a balloon, like a, like a Michelin man, so I was about twice my normal size. And so he looked, you know, he looked up at me and then I was a bit shocked that he just sort of looked back down and did whatever he was doing with a chainsaw or something. And then he looked up again in shock, realising it was me and that, uh, seeing the, uh, the horror, horror and pain on his face will never leave me. Uh, he was uh, just instantly distraught and, you know, my dad was a tough man, five foot six, bald, bushy, you know, he worked in the Kimberleys, uh, you know, he was just always a tower of strength and just to see him sort of, I wouldn't say lose it, but just look like he was in absolute panic uh, actually sort of made me more aware of how much trouble I was in, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And it was a bit, a bit confronting because I'd never seen him uh, ever be anything but strong. Right. So did he grab you and take mm-hmm. you inside or what was the what was the first action? Or can you remember that or is it all get a bit hazy? No, I can remember that this next bit of, of the tale, I don't know, I sort of must have come to something, you know, something, something happened. I, I don't know what, uh, you know, what changed, but why I suddenly, but I felt what happened was I took charge. Somehow, even though I had severed my vocal cords, Dad came to me, what happened, what happened? You know, as I got off and I got off and, you know, he held me because I nearly fell over and I just managed to croak out flying doctor, flying doctor. So two words. I shouldn't really have been able to say it, but somehow I managed to managed to say those two words. And so he took me into, inside the house and uh, immediately called the flying doctor and that's when, uh, you know, that chapter of the story started. The Royal Flying Doctor Service relies heavily on our professional flight nurses, both for emergencies and within our daily clinics. So we really appreciate that QSuper ensures RFDS flight nurses in Queensland can access some of the specialist training they need. QSuper is also here to support you. As one of Australia's oldest and largest super funds, QSuper has the experience and expertise that comes from over 100 years of putting its members' interests first. Its unique investment strategy is designed to weather life's highs and lows to deliver strong, long-term returns. This allows members to focus on today, knowing the future's in safe hands. Find out more by searching YQ Super online. You're inside and the flying doctor's being called. How are you doing then at that point? Are you still gasping for air and trying? Like, how are you... Coping. I'm gasping, gasping for air. I'm breathing like this <gasps> every right. time, you know, trying to get enough air, you know, like yeah. unbelievably big breaths to try to get some air in there, which is draining in itself. Yeah. Um, uh, but I still had the clarity. I still sort of uh, felt like I knew what was, you know, what, what was going on and, you know, sort of how to save myself. I don't know why. Uh, Dad initially just immediately took me into the, his bedroom and lay me on the bed and got, for some reason, some frozen peas <laughs> out of the fridge and put them <laughs> on my back. Of course, lying down on a bed was completely the wrong thing to do because that just made my my uh, lungs collapse even further. And so, you know, I, I, so I lay there for about a minute and then I got up and took myself to the kitchen table Sat down across from a clock, which was, you know, just above one end. This was about midday. Dad had told me the flying doctor, or in fact, I heard the, heard it, the flying doctor say that there was going to be about uh, an hour and a half, that there was a bit of weather around. Yeah, he said it was going to be an hour and a half, so they were meant to turn up at 1.30. So I sat at the kitchen table with my hands, my palms on the table, and just sat there and just basically uh, manually tried to inflate my lungs to let them allow air into that. So I just push every, every breath and wow. watch, the, watch the clock and just count down the minutes. And did that help <laughs> if you manually pushed your chest? Did that help to get air in? 
It did. Yeah, I don't know how I knew to do that. I guess I, you know, I guess you sort of your body ha- has some sort of innate sixth sense about, you know, what to do in times like that. But, yes, that did help a little bit. Mm-hmm. From that moment, I felt like I was fairly stable. Meanwhile, uh, the flying doctor had just told Dad that he might need to look around for a, for a hose or something like that and get a sharp knife because he might have to, you know, give me an emergency tracheotomy. And that just Gosh. completely freaked Dad out. You know, I, he's like virtually, he's, was he in tears? I, I'm not sure. I can't cut the throat of my beautiful boy. And Dad was in a complete panic, in t- total shock. Wow. As I guess you would be, you know, your son, you'd feel like yeah, but maybe you'd almost killed him yourself. I don't know. Yeah, but you're meanwhile sitting at the kitchen table manually pushing your lungs in and out so that you can continue to get oxygen. Yeah. Okay. What happened next? I can't, I'm, I'm <laughs> this story is harrowing. What happened next? Okay. So uh, about, probably at about one o'clock, Dad called up just to, on an impulse. He was, you know, pacing around and asking me if I needed anything and blah, 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 and I just sort of was almost ignoring him, just trying to stay alive. And um, he called up for some reason. Uh, even though I hadn't gotten any, any worse, he called up the flying doctor again and said, you know, he's gotten worse. You know, can you, can you do anything? Can you get out here quicker? He must have thought I was just about to croak. He called, called up the flying doctor again and they said, oh, okay, look, we've got the flying surgeon. We could send them out as well. They'll be about another, they're a bit closer. They'll be, I'll get there at about a quarter to two, right? And so now there were two planes on the way, Dad calling up. And, uh, and really that's also saved me, as it turned out. So the plane, the first plane arrived on your newly created runway. <laughs> Mm. Just before then, though, the, the next-door neighbours, obviously hearing all this uh, kerfuffle going on on the, you know, on the open, you know, flying doctor service wireless, uh, had come out and they were about sort of 20 miles away, the closest neighbours, and they got there before the plane, about 15 minutes before the plane. It was a husband and wife. They came out in their, you know, their big four-wheel drive ute parked outside and they came in and sort of observed the scene and the first thing I remember vividly that the patriarch said was, how you going, Gordon, getting much rain? (laughs) (laughs) And then the the wife offered to make him a cup of tea. So that's... uh, how was he? Can you get? So that was that was the support crew. They that was came the in to support Dad more than anything else. <laughs> they did, and look, that was probably a good thing to do. They looked at probably both of us and saw that he was, you know, he was close to having a heart attack, maybe. <laughs> and you were yeah, manually no. keeping yourself alive. So they got the cuppa. They got, they got, they they got, got the, the cuppa. Yeah, they got the, the kettle on. I remember being quite annoyed about that at the time, but over the over years, you know, I've seen the humour in it, and they probably did the right <laughs> the right thing. In fact, it's very. I just felt that was a very sort of, you know, very country country Australian thing to do. <laughs> That's hilarious. So then, then the flying doctor, the first plane arrives. What yeah, happened they, they, then? They turned up about fifteen minutes late. They turned up at about a quarter to two, and the flying surgeon was going to turn up. And as it turned out, the the neighbours did uh, lend a hand. They went out there and ferried the uh, the flying doctor. Uh, who was a lady, um, back to the house with, uh, you know, the nurse and the pilot. And, um, yeah, I was at the kitchen table and I'm not sure what she thought had happened to me and there's no criticism of her, mm. but she put two needles into the top of my trachea with open sort of needles. I think she may have thought there was a blockage in my throat that I, you know, mm. Uh, and that, which did absolutely nothing and didn't help me at all. So uh, about 15 minutes after that, the uh, the flying surgeon turned up, and then uh, yeah, then <laughs> then things got even more weird. So tell me about that. So I understand it was an anaesthetist, <laughs> yeah, and he realised that you needed air fast, and he didn't yeah. have any choice but to take some drastic action. Yeah. So the the flying surgeon. Something that I didn't even know that the flying doctor had at the time before then uh, had with him uh, an anaesthetist from the Royal, the uh, RBH, the Royal Brisbane Hospital, 
uh, there. He was just out there observing. He was just going for a flight and, you know, with his mate. And he seemed, took charge. He seemed to know what to do. You know, he saved me as well. So he sort of took charge and he put a, a, length, of, um, a length of pipe, you know, garden hose-like pipe, I guess, uh, down through my mouth. Well, first of all, sprayed <laughs> anaesthetic in my throat which made me immediately just vomit all over the table, blood and what have you, yep. which was pretty, pretty disgusting. And then he says to me, look, Dave, you need to just tolerate this because this is the only thing that's going to save your life. Anyway, so he sprayed it again and I, you know, gagged and just stopped myself from throwing up. He forced it down my throat, right down, right into the lower part of my chest. Uh, and, you know, from then... That was pretty much the first time I thought I was probably going to live. Wow! So I started you suddenly... to be able to. I sudden I started to be able to breathe a bit better. Wow! So that pipe then gave you access to the oxygen that you were so desperately needing. Yeah. So the air, you know, what I was breathing in didn't need to go through the chest cavity and, you know, lose most of it, you know, into my tissue. Yeah. And I was, yeah, I was able to breathe to a certain extent. The only slight problem was that it was only just long enough to reach. And so it was irritating me. Right. And um, it, uh, it, for some reason, I started getting asthma as well at the time. I had childhood asthma and I occasionally had bouts of it. And so then I, you know, had to sort of contend with that, which was a bit unpleasant, but yeah. Well, see, it's an interesting, it's an interesting <laughs> problem, David, because first of all, you were in a very remote location and you had to be gotten to a tertiary hospital, but that required that you would need to go on a plane, which means planes at altitude will bring even more duress on your body and on your lungs. So mm. they had to be able to stabilise you to a point where they could actually even get you into a plane. Because yeah. uh, if they had just taken you and stuck you in a plane as you were at that time, um, it would have been, I'm sure, fatal. So, mm. so that's amazing. So they, all right, the teams <laughs> figured yeah. out how to solve this problem. Yep. Were you able to walk out to the plane or what happened to get you onto the plane? Yeah, that was, they did talk about that, whether they wanted to put me on a stretcher or something, but I walked out to the, um, uh, you know, to the neighbour's vehicle and they, you know, drove me to the, to the planes. Yep. And put me in in one of them. I'm not sure whether it was the doctor's or the surgeon's plane. I wouldn't know. Yep. But uh, I was in there. You know, they got me in the plane. You know, I was able to, you know, walk around now that I had a bit of air. You know, I wouldn't say that I was all right, but I had, you know, I was a lot better than I had been before. Yeah. Was your outlook so slightly different? Were you feeling a little bit maybe slightly more optimistic about your, your potential yeah, I, outcome? I felt that I'd survive at that time, which was pretty surprising because I'd you know, the whole time prior to that, I thought that I was, I was a goner. I was a dead man, you know, not even walking. Yeah. Um, having lasted that long, I mean, uh, I've been told that when you have that sort of accident, the normal amount of time it takes you to die is about an hour. And so I had the accident around 11 and uh, I didn't get any relief until after 2 p.m. So that was, uh, you know, a pretty good effort to be able to last that long. Wow. And that was that was really you doing everything that you just felt you natively needed to do to somehow get your body the oxygen it needed. Yeah, that's Amazing. right. Amazing. So, okay, so you're in the plane, you're heading to um, a tertiary hospital so you can get the surgery you need. Now, I understand it was stormy and that presented another challenge. Yeah, it was stormy. It was... Uh well, I mean, I wasn't really aware of, uh, you know, of the of the forecast, but I did did hear them say up the front that they may need to transfer to Bundaberg Hospital, which I understand wouldn't have had the resources or the uh, or the the human resources to be able to actually do the surgery that was required, which was quite specialised. Uh, so that was a big problem. Um, yeah, it was, there was lightning crackling around and, yeah, it was another stormy day. So it was, you know, it was a very brave effort from the Royal Flying Doctor Service to, to even take me down to Brisbane. Dad claims, and I can't verify whether this is true or not, that a channel of clouds opened up to get me through there. I think that may be slight exaggeration. Maybe that was just good piloting from the Flying Doctor, to, you know, to be able to navigate through the clouds. But still, uh, we made it. Now... On the plane, as I said before, I was um, getting very bad asthma. And, uh, you know, I said before that I was <laughs> counting the minutes down when I was 
at the kitchen table. In the plane, I was actually began to be suffering from quite a lot of pain. I think all the pain, all the adrenaline had worn off and the pain started coming. And uh, the asthma, I wasn't breathing well. And, you know, maybe you're right, maybe it was part of, part of being, you know, the pressure in the plane. Mm. So about halfway through that trip, they said we were going to get there at 5 o'clock, they said, and it turned out to be 5.30. But I'd actually worked out the number of seconds mm. until 5 o'clock and I was counting down the seconds until we got to Brisbane. That's how, you know, desperate I was feeling at that stage, counting down the seconds, looking at the clock. You know, just saying I can hold out. But then it was an extra hour I had to, right. <laughs> extra half an hour. Right. And so, yeah. If so you, David, to, if you'd had to drive mm, from where speculation, the property speculation was, all the way to that hospital, what sort of, how many hours would that be by road? Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> look, uh, speculation is virtually, if you look at a map of Queensland, what I would say smack bang right in the middle of the state. So to drive to Brisbane, I'd say, would take you 14 hours. I'm not sure. Right. So it would have been a 14-hour drive. So this is not a short flight. This no. Is, yeah. Okay. It's a long flight, particularly in a you know, small plane, a Cessna or, or whatever they were flying around in then. Yeah. You know, a little, um, you know, single-wing propeller light plane. Do you remember actually landing in the plane? I do. I remember landing and we were met by a helicopter um, and flown out uh, and taken out to the Royal Brisbane Hospital. I, I recall that we were met by a helicopter. I, <laughs> you know, then there was still another wait, so they, they got me out to the hospital and then the uh, they couldn't find the surgeon. <laughs> they, I was lying there on a gurney or whatever and they couldn't, uh, they couldn't find uh, Dr Hodge, who I think was actually at a party that night it was a it was a Friday night. Has to be the eighties. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they had to search around for him. He was the he was the gun at the time. He was the the president of the AMA. This is the surgeon who did the operation. Brilliant okay. surgeon, we a good friend, and you know we've you know gotten quite close over the years. You know, I've stayed, obviously gone back and seen him yeah. many times. Uh, they couldn't find him, so that uh, was an extra <laughs> an extra half an hour. Anyway, eventually, eventually they got me into surgery and uh, they they operated. And it was a four hour surgery, as far as I understand. It was a, a substantive effort yeah, to not... try to reconstruct everything and connect everything back up. And so I woke up after the surgery, and to my slight surprise, I woke up with to seeing my mum and my sister, and they were still wearing their. Fancy clothes because they'd just been at my cousin Jill's wedding in Brisbane. So they were actually in Brisbane. Uh, Dad was there as well. He had flown down in the plane, you know, he was sitting up at the front with the, with the pilot. So he was there. But there they were. They'd obviously stayed there all night and, you know, they'd been called out from this reception and they were there in their, you know, in their fancy clothes, which there's a photo of, you know, on the website, Independent Australia, after, you know, from the story you can see my mum and my sister in their fancy frocks. Uh, so, yeah, that's why I was in uh, emergency, uh, hooked up to a catheter, which was extremely painful. And, you know, I had, uh, I couldn't really move because they, they were reinflating my, my lungs. They had two tubes directly put into my lungs, which went down to these big brown bottles on either side of the bed, which was incredibly, incredibly painful. Every time like a little bubble would come out, you know, I'd be in agony. Um, yeah, and you hooked up to all the wires and stuff that you'd expect and, you know. But I was, uh, for all that, I was incredibly happy because I'd managed to survive. Part of the surgery was, um, you know, to reattach my uh, voice box, to tie it back up, uh, to, you know, to uh, give the, the vocal cords a bit of a chance to, to reattach, although that was un- going to be unlikely because, then, as you know, they're nerves. Uh, there's, so there was a brace over my over my voice box in my throat, so I was literally unable to speak in any way because of this brace. Of course, I had severed, severed vocal cords as well, which would make it a bit tough. And, um, yeah, so uh, I was just communicating with notes and, you know, I felt at that stage in the morning, believe it or not, and maybe I was on the happy, <laughs> you know, they had me a lot of painkillers, but I felt quite good, happy. Right. You know, it didn't, the whole uh, enormity of the situation didn't hit me until a few days later. Right. 
What was the road to recovery like for you? Was it a long process to to get to a point where, I mean, obviously you're talking to me today, so you've managed to recover your voice mm. and this is, we're talking about a story that's some decades ago now. So um, mm. has it been a long road? I had a, I would say, a unique recovery. Um, you know, very lucky recovery or a very fortunate recovery, whatever you want to call it. It was, you know, one of the real uh, good news parts of this whole story, I guess. First of all, uh, I was in a hospital. It was Friday. It was a week before I was meant to go back to grade 12. I was expected to be in hospital for six weeks, you know, to recover. But, you know, after a day, you know, they regarded me as being out of danger and they took me up and put me in the ward. And as soon as I was allowed to walk around, I was just walking around beaming, speaking to everyone. It totally changed my outlook. And um, I was just you know, so incredibly happy to have survived. You know, you, you know, for all the damage it had done to me, I couldn't talk, sure, you know. But I was just absolutely over the moon to having survived, having gone from thinking that I was dead to having lived was just such a boost that I was just beaming for days, believe it or not. So on the third day, after they, you know, Dad had sat there all night for days while I had these tubes in my lungs, which were causing me a lot of grief and pain, eventually they took them out. I was feeling a lot better, you know, like I said, I was walking around the ward beaming. Then on about the third day, Dr Hodge came in and, well, I asked him straight up, when am I going to get rid of this tracheotomy tube? Because that was the main thing, you know, I was breathing through a tube in my throat and Dr Hodge just baldly said, oh, no, you, you'll have that for the rest of your life. You know, you're just going to have to get get used to that. And I, But that's the first time I burst into tears and I was totally devastated. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, I was absolutely gutted. However, there was a resident there and I asked the resident afterwards, he said, you know, I said to him, is that true? Am I definitely going to have this tube? for the rest of my life. And he said, oh, no, I don't think that's necessarily true. I reckon it's 50-50. And that gave me some hope. And so after that, every every day, you know, obviously I'm a bit of a mantra person. You know, I'd gone from saying the Lord's Prayer every day, over and over again, I would tell myself, I'm going to get rid of this tube. I'm going to get rid of this tube. And, um, yeah, I did. And I think, you know, the resident was being a bit optimistic, I think, uh, from what I've been told. I'm the only person who's suffered a similar accident who has managed to get rid of their tracheotomy tube. Wow. I got rid of it rid of it after six months. But the reason why people need to keep their tracheotomy tube after they sever their vocal cords is the, the cords being nerves don't reattach, and so they fall down into a closed position, covering your um, your air channel. And but for some reason, mine had reattached, so they reattached, and that's probably why you know I've got a relatively good voice, a bit husky, and I'm able to breathe. I mentioned before that I was meant to be in hospital for six weeks. Mm. Actually, I was out of hospital uh, the following Sunday. Wow. And I flew, flew back up, got back to boarding school on the Monday, so I missed a day of school and I was back there on the Tuesday at school. No. A week <laughs> later you were at school? A week later I was at school and the follow and that weekend I played cricket. <laughs> Yeah, with my tracheotomy <laughs> tube. There's dedication for you. <laughs> <laughs> and made and made sixty against St Brendan's. As a matter of fact, that as well. That proves you are a very strong and fit sixteen year old, without question. Absolutely. <laughs> I just think that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. I think you are living testament, Dave, <laughs> of somebody that that Aussie spirit, that courageous, persistent. The tenacity that you've had to get through an incident like this, an accident like this, just just blows my mind. I think this has just been an amazing, uh, amazing story. I really do appreciate you coming to tell us your story. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, not just you, um, you know, showing the interest in this story, but also the amazing work that the Royal Flying Doctor do. They deserve, you know, everybody's support and gratitude, particularly out in the bush where they fulfil such an absolutely vital and necessary service. And um, I'm sure I will love listening to all the other stories that will come through in your podcast. So thank you very much. The Flying Doctor podcast was presented by me, Lana Mitchell. 
Executive producer is Alex Mitchell. Audio production by Matt Curry. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with someone who you think will love it too. I'm Lana Mitchell from the Royal Flying Doctor Service and thank you for listening to the Flying Doctor Podcast. Listener. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Before I go, I just want to quickly tell you once more about our supporter, Q Super. Superannuation specialist with a proud 100 year history, Q Super contributes to meaningful, sustainable partnerships that improve the well being of members, their families, and communities. To find out more, search Why Q Super online. Q Super's products are issued by the Q Super Board as trustee for Q Super. General information only, as it does not take into account your personal circumstances. Consider the PDS on Q Super's website to see whether Q Super is right for you.